of our suffering series. And um, just to recap, I know it's a couple of weeks since we did the last one. Last time we looked at the fear trap, the trap of fear, which so many of us can fall into. And you remember that the sort of key six things we looked at were firstly, your meditation can stimulate fear, the things you think about, the things you allow yourself to mull over. And I don't know if you've um, noticed any of your meditation over the past couple of weeks and actually caught yourself uh, feeding into this fear. But remember what a powerful impact your meditation can have. Remember that fear is spiritual war. Like with Pilgrim's Progress, we're always being pushed or pulled in one direction or another. Um, and we need to be very careful about letting fear get the better of us. We saw that fear is forgetful. Fear forgets all the promises that God has made. Uh, fear forgets what God has done for us. Um, we Fear forgets what God has done for other people. And it just sends us or can send us into a blind panic. And that will lead to it becoming the lens in which we see the world. And remember that graphic we saw of the same guy in the same room, but shot on different lenses. And he looked dramatically different as the lenses changed. And if you are looking at your life through the lens of fear rather than the lens of God's word, that can have a tremendous impact on your life. Um, on the positive side, we saw that fear of God will actually beat fear of man or fear of anything else, because ultimately, if you are fearing God and trusting God, as we're called to do, then other fears fall into their right place, which is nowhere near uh, as important. And finally, remember that fear is temporary. Even the worst thing that you are scared of right now, even you know those poor Christians um, facing the Taliban now in Afghanistan, that will not be an eternal situation. Whatever they face, it is temporary. And the only thing that is eternal is the Lord and his kingdom. And that is what we as his people have to look forward to. So we're looking at the traps. Now, this is the last trap we're going to look at um, because I know we've got one more session after this one. And so I want to do one of the, the gospel comforts. Um, but I wanted to look at the doubt trap because I think of these six traps, and again, if you want to dive into any more of these, I really recommend the book Suffering by Paul David Tripp. It's very, very good. Um, but I think that fear and doubt, you know, they can often go hand in hand. And I, I think that in my own life and in the life of many people I've spoken to, fear and doubt are arguably the two biggest traps which people can fall into during times of suffering. Certainly there is the envy trap where you envy other people and perhaps their perceived lack of suffering. Uh, there's also denial when you say, no, it's not, you know, it's not happening. It's, it's, it's OK. I can keep going. And of course, discouragement. I think discouragement is quite a big one as well. So if you're interested in the others, I really recommend getting hold of the book. It's very, very good and encouraging in these ways. So let's consider the doubt trap. Trip um, gives an example of a young man who came to him with an issue. And this sh issue wasn't a short one. He, th he thought, you know, the young man, when he started suffering, he, he lost his job and he had some health issues. And when it started off, he thought, it's okay. It will pass and I'll be okay again. But the problem got worse and his health got worse and he had to stop. Uh, he couldn't really go out the house. He couldn't uh, attend his job anymore. And then he stopped going to church groups. He stopped attending altogether. And all of this was because he'd start letting himself basically say, we well, started letting himself say, I don't believe that God is good anymore. Now it was very hard for him to articulate that because as Christians, I don't think we'd ever say that, but really we can start believing it and acting that we don't actually think that God is good anymore. We start doubting the character of God, the plans of God and the power of God. Now, speaking about this young man, Tripp said, there is so much I could say about the months we spent together, but I want to focus on one central thing because this was an ongoing uh, counseling session he had with this guy. In the middle of his despondency and withdrawal from his uh, life in church, was one fatal conclusion. He had quit believing that God is good. Again, that's quite an extreme thing to say. I don't know if anyone in this room would ever admit that they perhaps even allowed that thought to cross their mind, but it can be so insidious. There's a number of people that I've known that have started letting that thought in, in their life, where they stop thinking, actually, God is good. God's got it in for me. God doesn't want the best for me. Now, again, I know in our first session um, a couple of months ago, we considered at how your expectations of what you want from life, um, if they're not married up to God's word, you're going to suffer far worse because we need to make sure our expectations of what good truly is, both morally and for us, 
um, it needs to be shaped by God's word. Because if good for you is defined by you having an easy, comfortable, happy, prosperous life, then <laughs> most people in the world are not going to get anywhere near that. So, of course, you know, recapping that one of the earlier um, uh, sessions we had together, you need to make sure your idea of what good for your life and good in general is shaped by God's word, because otherwise you're in for a rude awakening. Now, the problem is with this doubt, when you start to doubt who God is and his goodness, it leads to a broken foundation because the foundation of all of our faith lies in the fact that God is who he says he is. Imagine if God was capricious. Imagine if God was like we are, if he was thrown to irritability, if he was thrown to moments of not being good, that would completely rock our worlds. Because everything that we do, everything we've learned over all these years, everything we do in our faith is based on the foundation that God is good all the time and he is totally trustworthy. So when you allow yourself to start doubting his goodness, it's that you can have you know, the best house you like on it, but the foundation will be absolutely wrecked and the house itself will come crashing down as well. We've got to be so, so careful in allowing this doubt to come in. And there are many people who've lived most of their Christian life saying, yes, God is good, but the moment their life falls apart like this young man and their world can be rocked, that's where this doubt allows to come in. Now, again, I know, look around the room, there's lots of people with different life experiences here, but have you ever felt the whispers of this doubt? Or maybe you've really had to wrestle with this in your life, just when you observe your life and the things that have gone on. Maybe there's been times when you have been tempted to wonder whether God really is good. Well, that's what we want to address tonight in this chapter. So let's just consider doubt for a second. Like fear, doubt isn't always a bad thing. We saw last time about, you know, how the, a toddler fearing to touch a hot oven is a very good thing. God gives us fear for a reason. And in the same way, doubt can be useful. You know, don't we want um, our children going online to be very careful and doubtful about the people they meet and the people that say things about themselves, whether that's true or not? I don't know. I received quite a few of these. Did you guys get any of these during the pandemic? <laughs> yeah, I think lots of people nodding. And some of them are quite convincing. Um, there was one that, that I got the other day that, that almost got me. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think a lot of people who perhaps, you know, will just take that and, and click on it straight away. A lot of people have lost a lot of money this way. So doubt, of course, can be a good thing. We get an example here of actually when Joshua and his men should have doubted and they didn't. I'm sure you know the story of the Gibeonites. I'll just read it here from uh, uh, Joshua chapter nine. However, when the people of Gibeon, so this is the people in the promised land, they're, they're slowly progressing and winning uh, the various battles. When the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and old wineskins cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. So there's quite a convincing ruse, far more effort than a text message. Then uh, they went to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, we've come from a distant country, make a treaty with us. The Israelites sampled their provisions, but did not inquire of the Lord. Then Joshua made a treaty of peace with him to let them live. And the leaders of the assembly ratified it with an oath. And for those that know their Old Testament history, you know, these Gibeonites did become a bit of a thorn in the side of um, God's people because they did not have a healthy doubt there. Critically, they didn't ask God. It seemed so cut and dry to them that these people were people from far away. They didn't even bother asking God. So doubt can be very, very useful in some ways, but it can also be very challenging. Now, we're just going to look at um, two sorts of doubts here that are that have you know one that's been good and one that has been bad um, in biblical examples. So the doubt of wonderment, and again, these are trips titles, not mine, uh, the doubt of wonderment and the doubt of judgment. OK, so these are two situations that you'll face where you're feeling doubtful and not sure about a situation, but there's sort of a right way. Trip makes the point in this uh, book and there's a wrong way to do it. So let's look at the right way, the doubt of wonderment. So in a nutshell, this is when we don't know what's happening. And let's be honest, I think we've all faced that where something has happened. We don't know what God's doing. We don't know why he's allowed to happen now. But we come to him 
in humble, reverent wonder, asking questions. And I think one of the beautiful things in God's word, we see people all throughout God's word, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, being able to bring their complaints, being able to bring their uh, worries and wonders and fears to God to ask him. Imagine if God just would not tolerate anyone to do that, you know, how difficult it would be to carry these burdens. But God invites us to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. So here's just a couple of examples. So um, Psalm 4 verse 1, answer me when I call to you, my righteous God, give me relief from my distress, have mercy on me and hear my prayer. So you see somebody's going through some distress here and yet he's going to God saying, Lord, answer me, answer me. Another one from Psalm 6. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I'm faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. How long, Lord? How long? So notice that none of these psalmists are accusing God of not being good or loving. They know they're suffering, but they also know that God is good. And so they take their fears to God and cry out to him. And we could have used many examples from scripture, um, you know, Jeremiah, Habakkuk as well. Now, the other one, which is the, the bad doubt, is the doubt of judgment. So again, same situation, something bad happens, you don't know what's happening. And instead of going to God in wonder and reverence and fear saying, Lord, help, you decide, it's like you, you cast judgment upon God, that because of this incident or whatever it is that's happened to you, he must be unfaithful, unloving, and I'm caring. So that's you passing a judgment on God and deciding that he is in this way because he's allowed whatever it is to happen to you. Now, again, an example from this from the Psalms, although this is not the Psalmist saying this is a good thing to do, but he's giving an example of the Israelites when they got the bad report and they, but, and they were scared. They despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his promise. And instead of going to him in wonder saying, Lord, there's giants here. What are we going to do? They grumbled in their tents and did not obey him. I'm sure many of you remember the sort of things that they would say, you know, he's led us out here to destroy us. Passing judgment on God in their doubt, which was not true and was not full of faith. So something we need to ask ourselves and we've already spoken a few um, sessions ago about how suffering will challenge your theology because suffering shows what you really believe. It's very well and easy when life is going well for us to say, this is what I believe, but the real test is when you suffer because that shows when rubber hits the road what you really believe. So it's something to ask yourself and consider, what has suffering done to my theology? What has it done to the way I view God and his presence, his promises and his power? Do I still believe that God is a definition of what is loving, good, wise, and true? Just consider the answer to that in your own heart. Again, I know there are a number in this room who have faced a variety of different issues. Do you, could you say honestly between yourself and the Lord that despite what you've been through, God is still the perfect definition of love, goodness, wisdom, and truth? Can you still hold up every one of his promises in his word and say, yes, I believe that? Classic Romans 8, 28. Do you believe that in the midst of your pain, he is still working that for your good, even though you can't see or understand why at the time? I think a, a, an important thing to remember in the doubt of judgment is, uh, and I think Peter does this so beautifully in 1 Peter 5, reminding us that we're not alone you know it can be such an easy thing when we suffer um to just to say okay god isn't good i'm on my own he's cut me off here he loves other people but not me but what's peter what does peter tell us be sober-minded be watchful your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour resist him firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world and i think that's a, a wonderful antidote isn't it to remember that you aren't alone, that Christians throughout the world are suffering in many ways. And I think to be honest, considering uh, Christians around the world, you know, those in Afghanistan, those in Northern Nigeria at the moment, actually they are suffering far, far worse than we are. It's interesting that Peter isn't, you know, trying to like just slap them back to wake up. So remember this is, you know, the, the letter of one Peter is written to those who are 
suffering. He's answering. Do you notice how this verse nine links on to the devil prowling around in verse eight? Doesn't the devil want us to think, where is your God now? Why have you been singled out? Maybe God has his favorites. Why isn't he listening to your prayers? But Peter says, no, no, no. This suffering is being experienced by Christians around the world. And I think I mentioned it to you before, but I quite enjoy reading theology type books and things of that nature. But I, I found apart from the Bible itself, far and away, the most blessing and encouragement I've had in my Christian walk has been reading the stories of other Christians who've gone before me, seeing the awful things that some of them faced. There was a video um, on YouTube, I forgot what her name was, but it was a, a female missionary to the Congo in the 60s and 70s. And um, she was attacked really badly. She was abused um, by rebels and really had a hard, hard time being a missionary. But the way she speaks about suffering and the way the Lord was with her and comforted her was so, so powerful. And I and, and you know, whatever your spiritual diet is, obviously, you know, reading God's word and spending time with him and whatever else you're reading, I would highly recommend factor into your spiritual diet, just reading about other Christians. I'm working through Fox's Book of Martyrs at the moment, and it's extremely hard reading, but it's just so encouraging to see how these Christians faced unimaginable pain and suffering, and yet they did it with the Lord, and he strengthened them. And I think just being reminded of your brothers and sisters throughout the world is such a great antidote to the doubt of judgment. So here we got these two sort of doubts, and one of them, the doubt of wonderment, even though you don't know what's going on, and that's the thing in common with both of them, it pushes you towards God because you go to God and say Lord I don't know what's happening how long Lord how long but you're going to him not passing judgment on him you're being reverent and you're going to him that is a great place to be in it does not require you to have the answers but it requires you to approach the one who does have the answers the doubt of judgment is the opposite it makes you run away from God because you stop believing that he is good and faithful and true Again, looking at your own lives, which one of these two would you say you fall into most? Have you made a habit of when you suffer running into the arms of the Lord and taking your complaint to him? Or do you have the doubt of judgment where you decide that's it? He hasn't looked after me. I'm not going to pay him any attention regard and I'm going to go and find comfort in anything else but him. It can be useful sometimes just to Google, you know, like complaint psalms and complaint prophets and just look at how people in the Bible approach doubt of wonderment, the sort of things they say and then actually praying these things to God. It's so good to pray scripture back to the Lord. So Trip gives us six steps to fight doubt. Um, there's always sort of an introduction to this chapter and then he gives us like, some steps. And this time again, it's six steps. So these are the six steps. If you've noticed in your life that maybe you can actually slip into the doubt, doubt of judgment, if you find yourself doubting God's goodness, these are st six, six steps from scripture that Trip gives us that we can use when we are struggling with doubt. So the first one is to fight the devil's lies, to fight the devil's lies. Now, we're always told, aren't we, that, you know, talking to yourself is often a sign of things not going so well. But the truth is, all of us are having an internal conversation most of the time, if not all the time. We're, or everything we see, everything we process, whenever somebody says something to us, whenever we're thinking about something, it's like we're having an internal conversation. It might not be that you're voicing any of it, but you are having to process what's going on. You're always talking to yourself about your life, what's going on? What's God doing? What's other people doing? What's your meaning and purpose? What's going on with your relationships? How are you coping with the, pr the trouble that you're currently facing? What is your hope? What about the past, the future, etc.? We're having these conversations with ourselves all the time. Now, a key question that Tripp asks us here is, has your suffering caused you to begin to believe things that are not true? And therefore, you say things that are not true to yourself. Now, this is a really key thing, because if this internal conversation that you're having with yourself is saying stuff that's not true, that's going to have a tremendous bearing on the way that you suffer. Again, classic example of this is in Genesis chapter three. He said to the woman that Satan, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, you sh will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, what's he getting her to do there? To doubt God's goodness. To doubt what God's uh, promised about death and to make her think that God's holding her back from something. Now, Satan doesn't really need to adapt his tactics, does he? Because they work then and they work now. Coming along to a Christian when we're suffering. Now, remember, Eve was tempted here in a world that wasn't, it's not like she was suffering at the time. We've got it harder in some ways because we are naturally inclined towards sin. Of, of course, when the Lord comes in and changes our hearts and he sets us free from its uh, dominion. But, you know, having a lifetime habit of being inclined towards sin means that we've got this predisposition which we need to consider. And also when we're suffering and he's saying, you know, God doesn't care about you. There are many people and many Christians who have listened to that over the years. Well, how do we fight it? We fight it with scripture. Didn't Jesus give us the wonderful example of that in the wilderness when he was suffering greatly, not having eaten, and yet he fought the lies with scripture. And this is an illustration from Pilgrim's Progress. And when Apollyon in um, the Valley of Humiliation is best in Christian, Christian reaches out and seizes the sword of the spirit and plunges it into the side of Apollyon. I've always wondered, you know, in so many films these days, when the hero's like losing the fight and there's something just out of reach and funny, they grab it. You know, I think, I wonder if Pilgrim's Progress is one of the first examples in historical storytelling of somebody doing that. But notice with Christian, it was with God's word. Christian had let go of God's word. And when he picked it up again, he was able to fight against the lies of the devil. Here are two really useful scriptures for your internal conversation. And I highly recommend memorizing these. So both from Psalm 119, verse 68. I love this one. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. If you want, just memorize you are good and what you do is good. I think teach me your decrees is great because it's something to pray on top of that. But if you drum this in, that everything God allows into your life, Lord, you are good and you do good. You are good and you do good. Everything you encounter, everything, says so whether you can't, you know, you miss your bus in the morning or whether you, know, you get some bad news on a phone call, Lord, you are good and you do good. And memorizing this verse is such a wonderful thing because it does not give the doubt of God's goodness to even have an inch in your mind because God is good and he does good. That's everything he allows into your life. He is good. And I think it's sort of expanded on in the next verse, um, a few verses on to verse 75. I know, Lord, that your laws are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. In faithfulness. Now, we take that the opposite, don't we? We say, the Lord has afflicted us. He's not being faithful. He's not being loving. That's a temptation, at least. But what does the psalmist say here? In your faithfulness. This morning in worship, it was a bit of an odd passage to choose for worship. Um, but I, I, I took the church to, uh, to, to Judges 3, verses 1 to 4, when it said that the Lord left some of the tribes in the promised land. Why? Because the new generation of Israelites had never seen warfare. And so God wanted them to be trained in warfare and he wanted to see whether they would obey him um, in the opposition with these people. So out of his faithfulness, he allowed his people to face that challenge. My friends, all the things that he allows into your life is given to you because he's good and because he's being faithful to you. Do you see that at the time or do you let the doubts creep in? So again, I think there are many verses you could use for your internal conversation, but I highly recommend these two verses because they are fantastic reminders that God is good, he does good, and out of his faithfulness, he afflicts us. So question, and he always has a challenge question at the end of his points, have you allowed the lies of the enemy whisper to you in struggle to sow seeds of doubt about God? They can be so insidious and they can have such a devastating effect. Mm -hmm. The next antidote to doubt, count your blessings. Now, we know this, people say it often, but how many of us genuinely make a habit of this? Writing down that which God has blessed you in. It can be very hard in the middle of suffering to actually remember anything good that God has done. As scandalous as that sounds, sometimes we can get so tunnel vision that we forget entirely. But counting your blessings is such an antidote to doubting God's goodness. Tripp says, a thankful heart is the best defense against a doubting heart. 
count your blessings, name them one by one. Uh, again, uh, uh, it's a phrase I've heard many people say, but this is, now I don't know where this is from a hymn or a poem. Um, I didn't have that down in my notes, so my bad, if you know it, um, you'll know which one it is, but um, I, I love this. It says, when upon life's billows, you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord have done. And that's so true, isn't it? We can so easily forget what he's done for us. And yet if you were to listen down, you in the middle of your pain, you'd be like, wow, okay, God has actually done a lot for me, regardless of what you've been through. God has blessed us all so, so much. Where the people were encouraged to do that in um, 1 Samuel 12, weren't they? Be, uh, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. And I'd, I'd really suggest that in your um, devotional time with the Lord, you know, however you, you build your devotional time with him every week, you know, there's different things we read and pray about and, and encounter, but considering what he has done for us needs to be one of the things that we build into our devotional life, because otherwise we forget, you know, especially in the rat race of the West, where it's just like, okay, I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, you know, church leadership, or uh, whether you've got like a, you know, conventional office, whatever it is you're doing, we're all just like, okay, next thing. And we just forget all that's gone behind us, all the things God has done. So maybe get a notepad and just tonight, half an hour, just you and the Lord, just list everything you can think of that he's done for you and make a habit of thanking him for all or some of that list every single week. And that is a wonderful antidote against doubt. So again, Tripp asks us, have you taken time today to recount the many, many blessings that are yours as God's child? Because we have so many blessings, don't we? We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Third one, when you're tempted with doubt, daily confess your struggle to believe. And this can be a very hard one for people to do because it really involves humbling ourselves before God. But isn't that such a wonderful posture to come to the Lord with? You can probably imagine which verse we're going to go from here, Mark 9, 24. Immediately the boy's, boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. That's a lovely prayer, isn't it? Lord, I do believe in you. I know you're able to heal my boy, but also I've got some unbelief and I need help overcoming it. I think it's a beautiful prayer because it shows that this ability to do overcome unbelief is not something you need to generate yourself. So often we sort of think, okay, so God's there and we can go to him for certain things. But if I'm you know, not wanting to have my quiet time today, if I'm not wanting to come near him in prayer, if I'm struggling to doubt, uh, sorry, struggling to trust in him, I've got to deal with that myself. But you know what? That's not true. In my life, you know, we all have those moments. You know, when you have like maybe a really good Sunday and you're really close to the Lord and then on Monday morning you wake up and for no discernible reason, it's not like you've fallen into sin or anything, but you just feel a bit colder towards him on, on the Monday morning. And I found that actually every time you're feeling cold, every time you're feeling far from him, before anything else, just get on your knees and saying, Lord, I don't even want to be praying this right now, but draw me to you, help me. And you know, there is never one time that he's failed to answer that prayer. And so there's this beautiful dependence on him in every part of our Christian life. If you're struggling with anything, temptation, doubt, coldness of heart, just come to him and say, Lord, I don't even want to be, feel like I'm be doing this right now, but I need you. Help me, please help me. And he is so gracious that he does. Remember that saving faith isn't even of ourselves. Ephesians 2, I say, it is a gift of God. We can bring nothing to the table ourselves. It is all of him. And so we can go to him in confidence, asking for the help because he will give it. So again, question from Trip: In your struggle of faith, do you run from the Lord or to him? Do you, when you're struggling to believe in him, do you say, Lord, I'm struggling, help me? Or do you just think, I'm not feeling it, I'm off? Real challenge. Okay, fourth one. Very cheesy picture, but get busy. Get busy. I think in times of doubt, when we are tempted to worry about God's goodness and we're tempted to sort of drift away from him, it can be very easy just to start moping can't it? And to feel sorry for ourselves. And we begin to withdraw from, you know, maybe speaking to other Christians because we don't really want to speak to other Christians who are on fire when we're not feeling it ourselves. Um, we can start withdrawing from church meetings and, and, and um, other people and doing stuff. But actually a, a sure antidote when you're going through this is to do stuff. Now, again, I'm not sort of trying to preach, you know, if you do all this stuff, your life will be fine. But again, from 1 Peter 4, the suffering uh, book, what does Peter say here? The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, 
love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality one, to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Christ Jesus. And just uh, summarizing, because there's a couple of verses on from 1 Peter 4, uh, earlier bits, but it's verse 19. So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Suffering and maybe doubting is not a license to just think, do you know what? I deserve some me time. I deserve some comfort. Didn't Christ on the night before he was crucified, if anybody ever deserved to go and have some me time and to be pampered, spend it teaching his disciples and washing their feet and listening to them argue about which one of them is the greatest. But in that, he set the pattern. He entrusted himself to his father, as we saw in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he continued to do good. My friends, when we suffer, when we're doubting, do not stop serving the Lord. Continue to do good. And I know it can seem really hard, but there is such a blessing in doing that. So the challenge, has suffering robbed you of your enthusiasm to do the good thing God calls all his children to do? Fifth one, encourage other doubters. We looked, I think we looked at last time of, of how when we go through suffering, you know, the Lord can often put us in a situation so that we can bless other people facing a similar thing. Now, I'm sure that, again, in this room, many of us at one stage or another have probably doubted in some way. Maybe you haven't doubted the goodness of God, but I'd imagine you've probably doubted something else. It's quite natural for us to go through these moments when we're up and down and in the down moments, we perhaps do struggle with it. And having gone through those situations, it means you can be a tremendous encouragement and help to other people. Trip talking about his own suffering um, when he had the, the massive kidney problems. He said, as I was suffering profound weakness after un undergoing many surgeries, because his life just got turned completely upside down. And as I lived with the burden of wondering what would happen next, I met individually with young pastors each week. My goal with each meeting was to encourage these pastors who were struggling with the hardship of being young in ministry and pastoring struggling churches. What happens morning after morning in these meetings is that I left encouraged. Now I think that's fascinating because wouldn't his temptation just be to curl up, focus on himself, focus all his energies into himself. But actually the Lord had used the time of doubt that he went through, the struggles that he went through to bless other pastors. And there is tremendous strength to that. And I think again, last time we'd mentioned 2 Corinthians chapter one, where Paul despaired of life. He really struggled because of, uh, 1 Peter and 2 Corinthians are fantastic books when you're suffering to read through. But Paul went through that suffering so he could learn to rely on God and encourage the Corinthians in that way. Sorry, it's right here. I'm all over the place. Right here. 2 Corinthians 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all compassion and the God of all comforts, who comforts us in all our troubles. So what? So we can just think great and be in a little ball? No. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. That's so wonderful, isn't it? God gives us, imagine you, you've got a bucket and it's empty and God pours the water of comfort in and he doesn't say, keep it for yourself now. Go and give it to other people. Share how I have blessed you and helped you and got you through with other people who are suffering. God has not designed us to be islands, to be lone wolves. He's designed us to come alongside each other and help each other. So as you are suffering, and again, the question he has to ask for us here, who near you, maybe in your family, maybe in this church, needs the encouragement that you need yourself? I'd, I'd imagine it's probably a lot of people because we all go through ups and downs, don't we? What has God been teaching you in your time of suffering and how can you bless other people with what you've learned? How can you point them towards Christ. And thinking about coming towards Christ, our last one, let doubt drive you to Jesus. It was hard to get a graphic for this, so this was the best I could come up with. But somebody clinging onto the cross in a storm. Let doubt drive you to Christ. Remember that you are not alone. This is the famous uh, footprints illustration that all the way 
he's with us. And even in the time with the one set of footprints, he carried us all the way. But remember that Jesus himself says, and sorry, I, didn't, I haven't got it on the screen, that's my bad, but um, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Remember, my friends, you never, ever have to fight this battle again. Even if you're having doubts, you can run to Christ. And he is ready and waiting to accept you. He cares for you so much and he will not turn his back on you in his moment of need. So to recap the six steps to fight doubt, fight the devil's lies. Remember the internal conversation, memorize scripture. Uh, those two verses from Psalm 119, uh, fantastic for that. Make a habit of counting your blessings and thanking God for the things, the many great things he's done in your life. Daily confess any struggles you have to believe. Be honest with the Lord about your failings and ask him for help and he will help you in those areas. Get busy. Don't let suffering drive you and doubts drive you to moping around. But look at how you can help and encourage other doubters, number five, and let any doubts drive you to Jesus. And again, I think that sort of links into the doubt of wonderment, isn't it? Let, let doubts drive you to God in wonder, humility, and reverent awe. So just a couple of um, uh, questions for reflection and that's sort of been uh, covered already, but just to remind you. So firstly, how does your theology influence your internal conversation? Remember, we're all talking to ourselves all the time. And if you do not have a solid handle on what God's word is, what his promises are, what his word says, then your internal conversation is not going to be nearly as scripture filled as it could be. Secondly, are there areas of your life and which areas of your life do you struggle to trust God in. I think all of us have different areas that we say, okay, Lord, I trust you here, but I'm really struggling to trust you here. Which are they? And you need to identify them and go to God with them. And of course, find some verses to memorize um, as you fight these doubts. And again, those two verses, if you want to write them down, if you haven't already, uh, Psalm 1968 and verse 75 are fantastic because God is good and what he does is good. And he afflicts his people out of faithfulness because he's working all things together for our good let's pray lord god we thank you so much <clears throat> for your mercy and your patience with us lord like the father of that boy who was possessed by the demon all of us to some extent have to say lord we believe help our unbelief lord so often we let doubts creep in and shape the way we think about you and our lives and our purpose Lord, I pray that we would be so saturated with your word that when our internal conversation is, is telling us things that we don't like, Lord, that we would remember that you are good and that you do good and that out of faithfulness you afflict us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have a posture of gratitude in our life, that we would make a habit of counting our blessings, of thanking you and praising you for what you've done every day of our lives, Lord. I pray that you would help us to be honest about any struggles when we're feeling cold hearted, when we're feeling doubtful, Lord, help us to run to you, not away from you. Lord, I pray that you would help us not to be so inward looking, Lord. I know so much of this culture in this day and age just loves people being navel gazing and looking inwardly and focusing on your own problems and not that of other people. But Lord, I pray that as we suffer, you would help us to continue to serve you, to entrust our souls to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. Help us to look for other people or lay people on our heart even now that we can come alongside and encourage like Tripp did as he was suffering. And Lord, I pray that our doubts and our fears would never drive us far from you. Instead, they would drive us to you. We may not understand, but we know the one who holds the universe in his hands. Lord, draw us to you. May doubt... Um, cause us to run to you with open arms knowing that those who come to you you will in no means cast out we thank you again lord god for your grace and your mercy and i pray that we would just come to you with all of our doubts and our fears and our failings because we find that you are a god who is gracious and loving and merciful who promises to never leave us or forsake us lord we love you and we thank you that you are good and that you are faithful in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.